speaker coming from Chicago, Illinois today, we have David Q with us. David is the Global Vice President of Joint Commission Resources, an affiliate of the Joint Commission. David, please do turn on your camera and join me. He has over 25 years of experience leading innovation in healthcare from electronic prescription to electronic health records to patient safety and quality. Joint Commission Resources is a global leader in patient safety and quality improvement with customers in 75 countries. David, it's a real honor to have you with us. Very much looking forward to this building a culture of innovation in healthcare with you today. Thanks for taking the time to share your expertise with our global audience. Thank you so much, Chair. Good morning. Great. Uh, good morning. Glad to be here and uh, take some time to share my experience in healthcare, developing, promoting a culture of in innovation. And I assume most of our audience today are from healthcare industry like myself. I've been in healthcare for about 25 years. And uh, as you know, that the healthcare in the United States as industry had a lot of challenges even before the pandemic. You talk about the uh, reimbursement pressures, cost cutting. I've seen a lot of merger acquisition from the hospital side in the past few years. The nursing shortage, the you know physician and and you know provider uh, overwork and a lot of uh, pressure to be compliant with the Joint Commission and CMS. Just a lot of changes. And uh, now pandemic, right? Everything has changed. Uh, our life, both professional life and personal life, we, you know, kind of adapt to a new reality. So uh, I believe uh, at this time, it is particularly important for business leaders as all of us around the call today to think about how do we adapt ourselves? How do we change the business model? How do we engage our customers and our employees in, in this post pandemic um, era? So I'm glad to have this opportunity to just to share a couple of um, Style process, and again, this is not me presenting, but it is a, a truly a mutual learning opportunity. A little bit about myself. So I, as I said, I'm in healthcare for about 25 years, and started um, with um, uh, Joint Commission Resources for the not, last nine years, and we are affiliated with the Joint Commission, and also we have this international arm, Joint Commission International. So we're doing accreditation, publication, education, and consulting in. 75 countries and uh, my prior life I've been in innovation in healthcare for most of my careers and uh, developing electronic prescription with Allscripts, electronic health worker and also did a couple venture with um, healthcare organization that are venture capital funding. I was CEO of two companies myself and I'm also I'm on the board of um, a number of organization. I'm still on the board of um, uh, an investment firm Purple Arch Ventures. So I talk a lot of with our healthcare innovators and entrepreneurs trying to um, uh, make a different, uh, you know, uh, really change our industry. So I'm really glad to uh, to be with them and to bring some experience over. So you look at the pandemic and as we speak, and as you know, in the United States, we have over 30 million people got affected with the uh, coronavirus and 500,000 people have um, died because of this. So according to CDC, this is the third leading death contributor in the year of 2020, so which is very unfortunate. So um, a lot of business are changing. And the way we do education, we do virtual e-learning, we do survey, we have to move to virtual surveys. Telehealth, right? Telehealth has, you know, expanded about 3,000% from less than you know, half a percent of our total claim to about more than 5% of total medical claim are coming from the telehealth. So um, I was reading an article from McKinsey and talking about the future impact of this pandemic. I think as you all agree, the future impact is, uh, is fundamental and uh, they are predicting 25% of our workers in the, in the United States will likely to work remotely three plus days a week. There's seeing this tremendous acceleration of 
digital e-commerce engagement in our society across all industries. And, and we're seeing continuous um, telehealth engagement from our consumers, from our payers willing to um, pay for a lot of virtual visits. So they're also seeing 15% um, of um, reduction of um, workforce in customer service, in, in support, in retail. They're seeing a tremendous uh, workforce shift to technology, to healthcare as a result of this um, unprecedented uh, pandemic change. So some of the learning objectives today. So I'd like to, again, take a few minutes to talk about innovation that in my view, this is not um, a special product you do or strategic um, things you do every year. This is really part of our culture. You know, as an organization, how do you develop your product? How do you go to market? How do you make decisions? How do you take risks? Those are really embedded into your culture. So I will give some examples. And, and also I will make this kind of argument is that innovation really has to deliver values. It's not about just developing something cool, something new. It's really about delivering value to the customer, customers, but in a different way. So in a cost-effective way, in a faster way. And also innovation is not about just having a brilliant idea. It's really about making ideas happen, right? As leaders, how do we drive changes? How do we fund the development? How do we bring value to the customer in a faster, faster pace? It's really about execution. And organization need to acquire new skill set change the culture, change the mindset. So I would give you some examples about those cultural shift. So uh, we talk a lot about this word culture. You know, you work in different organization, you can see how people relate to each other, how they work together. And I've been to some large organization, multi-billion dollar public traded organization to some startup company. And also today, Drink Commission is, is a mid-sized company. We're not a multi-billion dollar company. We're not a startup either, right? We're a fairly sizable organization with 2,000 employees. So I, I'm also on the board of other organizations. So when I see them approaching this innovation, they always talk about strategic planning. They always talk about creating an innovation team, right? Sometimes I, I, I just always advise them that innovation comes from your daily life. So it's not just about once a year, you go into a budgeting season to say, well, next year I'm going to do something different. I need a million dollar funding, right? Or creating a silo of, of innovation team to say, you guys are working on this innovation project because this is something that's new. Then everybody else have nothing to do with this innovation. So I always um, coach the leaders to think about innovation as, as how we drive our work on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It impacts every department, every team, every employee. So. When I look at how organizations work and I look at some of the internal processes, I ask myself, you know, this is coming from one, one of the coaching sessions I had with the CEO lately. I said, you know, Jim, so look at your internal organization. Do you really have this inspirational, bold, hairy, courageous vision that gets people excited every morning? And how do you approach that decision? Do you need a large committee of 25 people to really drive this consensus? Is that how you make decisions? Do you tolerate risks? Do you tolerate, you know, rapid failures, right? Is, is a failure, even a fast failure, fast mistake, is that something you can tolerate, right? And also as you go into this direction, once you drive the changes, do you delegate? Do you empower your managers, the frontline staff to make decisions, right? Or do you really control everything from the top, from, from C-suite? And externally the process is how close you are to your customers. How do you engage them? engage your customers, you know, today's customer or maybe future customer to make decisions together, to drive changes together. How often as a leadership team, do you analyze the competitive forces? Do, do, how close you are to your competitors, knowing what they do, how they pivot, right? Then how do you generate competitive advantage, right? Then then look at your speed market and your product life cycle. Does that take three months for you to bring some ideas to the market or does it take a year or two years for you to finish something? Right. These are some of the, the things I watch to 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 gauge how this organization run their business. And and this is tells me whether this organization has any innovation culture or not. So I see some of the barriers. As I said earlier, you know, I, I used to work for one organization that um, 10 years ago on the first month when I joined the organization, I was on a telephone call, a conference call. I 
now there were like 15 people on the call from sales, marketing, finance, legal, services, technology, product lines, and then all these different functions, right? So no one can say yes, you know, you know, but everybody can say no. So when somebody say no, I, I don't feel comfortable about this, I need more information, what happened? The whole process slowed down, right? So this is a very siloed approach in terms of committee-based consensus driving. Take a long time. While their competitors are moving faster, right, ahead of you and, and going to market to test, to learn, trying to uh, bring new value to the market, you are still debating within your four walls of the organization. You want to drive perfect decision, you want to make everybody happy. That culture isn't just going to work in terms of today's speed market. And worst case is, in some cases, no accountability. It's like, who is accountable for this new product line? Who is accountable going to this new market? Who is accountable to bring this product to life that creates certain impact, right? So with no accountability, you can imagine the result of that, of that uh, culture as well. So um, over time, I tried to do in, in, in my organization, I have three different departments, um, publication education, and also a cloud technology business. I asked myself that I want to create this culture where our people, our leadership team are very curious about new things. How do we really change? How do we deliver something better? They go to class, they go to webinars, they go to um, training, training uh, camp. They're always really curious about a better way of doing what we do. We never satisfy with a status quo. Every year I do an employee assessment, I do um, leadership assessment, I raise the bar about their their expectation. Last year you need learn something new and this year what are you going to learn, right? How do you solve the problem in a different way? And we do allow mistakes in the sense that we have this um, agile development approach in the first iteration, maybe it's not good enough. You go to customers, customers say, well, this workflow is a little cumbersome. You know, I'm thinking about something different. We come back, we revise and, and we change, right? So these, there are a lot of different, you know, thinkings and behaviors that create this culture. And this is the, some of the things I use within our organization. And I'm always eager to learn from you guys, from our audience in terms of what do you do? that recognize that innovation, recognize the behavior, and encourage people to, um, to think differently and to do different things. So of course, this needless to say that hiring the right people, right? People are, are smart, intelligent, hungry for learning, hungry to make a difference. That also a big part of your, your culture as well. So we mentioned earlier that innovation is about creating value for your customers, right? It's not just about having this brilliant idea. So you look at these firms, right? Well, we use them. You fly Southwest, you go to, you know, you know, Starbucks, which is my favorite place. And uh, you look at all these organizations, right? Over time, they de deliver different values and you can see the value, whether you're a B2B market or a B2C market, you can see the differentiation of the value and you appreciate the value. And you go to Starbucks, you know, you pay, actually pay extra, right? But I enjoy the, uh, the culture. I enjoy their, their coffee. I enjoy, having the opportunity to sit down with my friend and we can discuss new things. So, so I'm willing to pay for that extra value. So when we have the portal launch meetings within our organization, that there's always a lot of different ideas. For example, the machine learning, right? The buzzword, the big data analytics. I have different dashboard, looks really, really fancy, right? Different chart, different data, different insight. I always bring this question to our team, say, so what? You know, who cares? You know, who are you? creating value to, right? So this always got people to start to think about where is the problem? How big is this problem? Who cares about the problem, right? Who suffers, who benefits, right? Sometimes you realize in healthcare that people who suffer the problem are not people who pay for that. So how do you really make sure that the way you approach the problem solving is really bring the value to both the C-suite who writes the check to you, also to the users, to frontline clinician, right? They they have to see that this workflow automation, we do a mobile application with tracers, they have to see the value that help them to deliver better patient care or collect data faster or make their you know workflow simpler, right? So always ask that question, so who cares and so what? So the value proposition, I'm sure that you know when you drive this innovation project, you have to make a case to your CEO, to your CFO, because you need extra funding, 
this is something either budgeted or unbudgeted. How do you make that value proposition, right? There's different ways to think about the pillars, cost savings, it's efficiency gain. You, you're gonna if increase the efficiency of your customers or your internal staff, internal process. I'm gonna increase revenue for myself or our organization or increase value for, for customers. Better employee satisfaction and better patient experience, quality outcome, patient safety, or more market share, or even just mitigate risks. Whatever the things you do, right? You're serving internal stakeholders and you're serving external customers, right? When you ask about this question, so what and who cares? How do you make sure you deliver a clear value proposition? And sometimes we know we have different um, hypotheses on our, on our mind. This is gap solves certain problem, right? This is good in terms of X, Y, Z. Uh, I, I encourage our audience to go back to maybe start a focus group you know, with your customers and maybe do a, do a market research or do a survey to make sure you truly understand the underlying problems, right? That whatever the changes you're delivering, whatever innovation you drive to market, you do have a strong value proposition. You can say that easily. You can articulate the value proposition. The customer can, can understand and willing to pay for that. So innovation is about execution. It's really bring the ideas to, to the market. That's what really matters. Because again, I'm not talking about having a laboratory, right? Just doing a lot of research. We're about business that that have PL, right? Have the customers, right? What matters is to bring that idea to market. And this is where a lot of time I see in some of my former organization, in some the company that I'm coaching or I'm on a board, this execution is where the things get you know, break down and uh, either it takes too long or it never, it never happens. So I see that organization, they do a lot of strategic planning, you know, once a year, every three years, imagine the next five years and they do a lot of small analysis, you know, strengths, weakness, opportunities, spread. Sometimes they do too many of the SWOT analysis. They do environment scan, environment analysis, and they do a lot of internal blue ocean and, and visioning sessions and listen to all stakeholders. Now I'm all supportive of this activity. I'm not arguing or even against any of those things, but I tend to see the organization just go too far in terms of um, analysis, you know, analysis over analysis, and uh, they are not uh, looking to getting themselves closer to, to the clients, to the customers to, to get that critical learning. So I like to take this opportunity to introduce a new concept. And some of you may heard about it, or some of you can, can, can appreciate this, this is kind of a new idea that I use that a lot in our organization. So uh, Eric Rice wrote this book about the Lean Startup. And the concept is not just for you know, technology innovation, it's truly for any type of innovation, new product, new services, um, anything you bring to, to, the, to the customer, anything new. So traditionally, we always believe that that we do certain product development, you know, prototype, experiment. Everything goes to um, like the uh, the graph on 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 a, on a life upper corner. As time goes on, you know, you, your product become mature and scalable. But that's not the case in most of the innovation. You look at the bottom. Most of the times that your ideas, your your concept, your, the business model goes zigzag in, 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 in kind of in the bottom approach. What is that telling us is that as a leaders who drive innovation, we really want to know what can go wrong. We really want to learn inset as quickly as, as possible. So this is where in that startup company, we, we talk about the um, um, this concept called a minimum variable product, MVP. Sometimes you heard that abbreviation, MVP, minimum variable product. So in that concept is, is basically that you take look at your whole product line, right? What is the best way to take a small set of features that are useful, provide some value to your, to your organization, to the customers, but that, that doesn't get, get you two years of you know, investment or two years of um, product development, right? Maybe you're building a, a, a bike first be, before you're building the motorcycle, building a full car, right? How do you take that minimal variable idea, but really accelerate that product life cycle? Instead of six months, you take something to the market, maybe it's six weeks. 
maybe it's every two months, every quarter, right? How do you accelerate that product development, right? Really align yourself to the future market, maybe even engage your customer to be part of that innovation team. So that's something that I highly encourage our audience to, to read this book if you haven't, because this is truly um, a different way of thinking about bring innovation and executing your um, your product development. And this applies to service. You want to bring a new service to the market. How do you make sure that you deliver value that, that the customer really appreciate? So another book I'd like to um, share with our um, audience as well. This is something actually I just pick up rereading re this book um, in the recent months during the pandemic because I have this big presentation I make to my board and I remind our board to take a look at this book as well. This is um, a professor from Harvard, Medi uh, Harvard Business School, uh, Clay Christensen, and he wrote this book actually, you know, 15 years ago. But amazingly, the, the research, the, uh, the discovery 15 years ago still matters to our, our innovation today. It's, it's the book is called Innovator's Dilemma. So in this book, so he, he studied and he, he and his group studied a lot of companies. Those are not the company that are badly run, that, that people just make terrible mistakes. Those are really great companies that are really uh, managed well. They, they, they pay attention to the customers. They, they uh, develop new technology um, on, on the existing part of the line, which is kind of the, the blue line, right? You always add new feature functions to improve performance, whatever you do today, product or services. And they are asking great questions about return on investment. If I spend a million dollar to develop something else, would I get um, return on investment, right? They're very physical response, responsive, which is good. They do a lot of this kind of so good um, management practice, right? Uh, ask the right questions and doing the right due diligence. And uh, but unfortunately, according to the study over a period of time, then when the new technology, the disruptive business model, the disruptive technology, which is represented by the right curve, there are always a, a period of time. It could be two years to five years where the blue line you can see is on top of the, the, the right line, right? So you, if you invest a million dollar to develop your current services, to improve your services, improve your product, you might generate better return on investment than the new technology, because the new technology disruptive is not uh, picking up, the, the steam is not you know, scalable yet, right? However, during many research that the, the, the research show that once the disrupt technology start to pick up the, the pace, right? Most organizations cannot catch up. They cannot capture, they cannot leverage that, the new disruptions and many companies will just go out of business as a result of that, right? So the question is always that as leaders, right? While we're serving our current customers, right? We have a business to run, we have a margin to make, and we have strategic goal we need to hit. How do we pay attention to the undercurrent, the new business model, the new technology, the new forces are kind of brewing behind the scene, right? How do we make sure we don't left behind then when the new technology catch up that we can just, we can no longer capture that. This is something that is actually the history piece many, many times. So I always urge our board to say, you can't look at our current market. You just cannot listen to our only the current customers, right? You really have to look at what industry is going forward in the future. So sometimes within a large organization, just because the, the internal culture, internal barrier, internal resistance, they cannot organically execute a major transformation. That's why you see these kind of instrument, merger acquisition, spin-off, JVs, or strategic alliance. And I propose these ideas to, to some of our um, uh, board members. And we have been doing a, a joint venture uh, with a major uh, healthcare organization um, in China, and we have been doing partnership with certain countries in the EU, and also certain uh, alliance with a company in Brazil, because we're really understanding that we cannot drive all the changes organically. The speed market, the part of life cycle, the local knowledge, the resource requirement. So sometimes we are acting bold, because this is where 
we feel that organic growth isn't going to get us to where we need to be. So last is talk about the leadership role model. Now I put this as a last topic, not because it's the least important. In the contrary, this is the most important thing I believe as leaders, we need to think about ourselves, what role do we play? Because leaders, especially the C-suite, the CEOs, the, the vice president, the senior vice president, the chief um, marketing officer, the chief medical officer, the chief technology officer, or whatever your title is, that how do we lead within our organization? Because our team look upon us, the way we act, the way we think, and drive the entire culture of, of the organization. So I, I try to remind ourselves that innovation has to be supported from the top. Sometimes I educate our board, right? Trying to recruit the board member to, um, to our board so that they can really drive uh, our change and impress us and challenge the leadership team to drive forward. And internally, we have structure issues. I talk about sometimes in certain area, there's lack of accountability. Sometimes there's the silos. Sometimes there's internal competition, right? Between different affiliates within the whole enterprise. So as leaders, how do we minimize that silo? Minimize that internal distraction? Because when you have that kind of thing going on, you know, it's, it's demoralizing for people to bring ideas forward, right? And uh, sometimes I ask, you know, so what? Because we're, 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 we're fighting against each other. So how do you remove those distractions? And how do you make sure you support your team, get the right investment? So in one of our departments I've seen in the past couple of years, we tend to always under funding our initiative. Our leadership come to me and say, hey, we need you know, half a million dollars to, to create a new process, to create a new market. We we'll always give them, you know, half of what they need or one third what they need. That's not going to work, right? So make sure we fully support our team, giving them enough resources, human capital, um, monetary capital to do what they need to do, and and nurture nurture the team, solving big problems. Sometimes make difficult decisions. One of the things I always say is that innovation is not always about what you want to do, but also decide what you not to do. So this week I made announcement to our organization, we are, you know, uh, DC supporting or terminating one of the product on the market. It's one of our certification product. The reason I do that is because trying to freeze up resources for other more critical innovations and also trying to keep our business simple. Because every time I see this organization it's just keep adding more and more and more, there's always something more, never taking anything out of your plate, right? Then our team, your focus, your workload, your distraction, it's just, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna make anything successful. You would rather wanna do fewer things, right? But then make those fewer things much more successful. So make a difficult decision. Tell your organization what you decide not to do. Last but not least is recognition and celebrate because innovation requires a lot of work. You know, I do work over time. Sometimes I see our team work over time to get something out to the door, meet certain timeline and goals. They travel over the weekend, they go to an international place to do market research, to do a product experiment. It's, it's not easy. So people need encouragement. So we have a lot of celebration, celebrate small success or even small mistakes. And we have um, a recognition award for people to um, go extra miles. And I sometimes I do simple things. I, write a little note to the team. Hey, great job in, in taking this idea forward. Hey, great job to signing this contract. Hey, great job doing this experiment, right? Uh, I learned something from you guys as well. Those kind of leadership nurturing, recognition, and celebration is critical to support that culture of innovation going forward. So really, as kind of a, a summary, you know, putting these two, four pieces together, as an organization, right, I always view the innovation is not just doing one project or maybe one strategic planning, right? It's not, it's not one shot. It's, it's about every day as leaders, how do you approach your, your business decision, business process, how fast you, you make decision. You do want to listen to your shareholders, stakeholders, and I'm not saying you should not um, listen, you should, but you need to make the call. On, on a timely basis. You need to decide where you go as an organization. You cannot reaching that perfect decision, trying to reach entire consensus. So value is important for innovation. 
because if it's no value, then you cannot sustain that effort, right? Because at the end of the day, we all here work for customers, internal customers or external customers, right? Ultimately, that value creation is, is what drives your success. Last but not least is the two things, innovation is about execution. You know, without the results, then nothing matters. Then next year, people just say, you know what, we had this discussion, we had this planning, but I didn't see anything happen. Then you lose that credibility as leaders to drive innovation. Then of course, leaders, you need a lot of nurturing, a lot of support, solving problem for your team and recognizing heroic behaviors and celebrate every little success, every little mistakes too, because that kind of culture encourages people to um, go forward, right? Overcome challenges. So those are the four things that I would like to share with you today in terms of how I pay attention to my organization to develop the culture of innovation. I'm sure there are many other experience, the tips, the strategy, the tactics that you guys use to drive innovation within your organization. And uh, I, I wish to um, to have the opportunity to learn from you guys and to create that a community like today's forum, to have that voice to share the learning and so that we can grow together and create some um, innovative technology to the market to really improve healthcare. So thank you so much for today and uh, my pleasure to be here. I would love to take a few uh, questions if there are. Thank you, David. Uh, that's a great that's a great coverage of uh, building a culture of innovation in healthcare. So I'm going to ask you please to uh, stop showing your screen at this point and I'm going to come back with my camera. Um, and uh, uh, for the audience, I already have uh, several of your questions lined up here and I will keep looking for, for more. <laughs> and uh, um, David, um, go ahead and hit the button that says stop showing screen. You may have hit the one that says pause. There is one next to it that says stop. Perfect, perfect. That's the right one. Thank you. Um, a, a number of great questions that have come up here, David. Uh, one has to do with uh, governance, with innovation. And it sounds like, oh, governance. So that sounds like you're going to stifle the whole thing by having governance. But I think that the people who understand innovation well understand that for it to really grow and scale innovation for value creation, there's going to be some level of governance for innovation in the organization. Curious about what you have seen in the marketplace uh, or in your own experiences that, that has worked well in terms of roles and responsibilities for, that doesn't have to be big, but maybe a small structure and, or, or, and, uh, and governance for identifying, prioritizing, and executing on the right innovations. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is really important to have that appropriate governance to steer the, uh, the direction of the organization. So in the past two career moves, so what I've seen within my organization and the others is that we have a small team of, of five people. Uh, we serve as the, um, uh, this, we call them the officer team. That's really including the five of us, the, the senior VPs of our organization. So we do from this very small committee and to, uh, to make sure we're, we're holding ourselves accountable to um, look at the uh, business priority. Sometimes there's a conflict, conflict of interest, conflict for uh, um, direction or competing priority, competing resources. So once we make that um, decision and we go through on a quarterly basis to evaluate the opportunity, and then we downgrade or, or we delegate that decision, that uh, execution decision to the, um, the department head, whoever has the PL, because we wanna make sure that, that who have the PL drive most of the decision they make. And uh, um, we don't want to be the barrier for them as well. So we try to keep a, a governing body simple. And we realize that having a, a large team to uh, to govern the uh, all the different priority create a lot of um, inefficiency. So we'd like to keep the governance um, on, a, on a pretty simple. Now, of course, I understand within a large organization uh, with shared services, corporate, and then business union, then the uh, multiple different affiliate, there tend to be this thinking about having the, the whole big corporate infrastructure coming together to, to decide and debate. And a lot of time, I don't see that working really well. Very well. Um, another question that, or theme I should say, that came across in multiple questions is with the definition of innovation itself. Um, there has been a tendency because of exponential technology acceleration that uh, people start equating innovation with technology. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Is that true? And uh, and if that's yeah. not true, so what is that's, really innovation? That's a great question. I actually, very funny, um, I just made a, a presentation, a, a moonshot um, presentation to our board just about two weeks ago. I talked about the innovation in the sense of um, in a strategic con context is that I want to bring value to our customer in a, in a different way than our competitors. At the end of the day, the reason we're in business, not for profit, for profit, we will deliver value to our, to our customers, right? No matter what market segment you're in, driving, you know, healthcare delivery organization, healthcare service organization, technology, whatever, you have competition. So innovation really has to do with creating different value than your competitors and how you deliver value faster to your, to your, to your, to your uh, um, customers. And that's really drive the innovation. So I would say innovation uh, is about um, um, the business strategy and improving the, the, the business process and the value delivery. Now, I would say technology is, is enabler. In some cases, technology is game changer because you have this new drug formula, right? you have this new um, data analytics platform. I definitely see technology is, is, is uh, enabler and ex accelerator. And sometimes it, it's really a key piece, but it's not just always about technology. Very well. And uh, so when you look at uh, the innovation across organizations, as you alluded to, it's about value creation. And then can and, and, and you, know, you can have like disruptive innovation that's very business model, different paradigm to your business model altogether. You can have, you know, then your core and your adjacent innovations, which are more like, you know, the day to day and the extensions of that core. Curious about when you see organizations that do well, what kind of mix they have between core innovation, adjacent innovation, and disruptive innovations that you see on their portfolio? That's great. So uh, I wish I know who uh, asked the question because we can share some learning together, and maybe I can post some um, some uh, study that I one article I wrote about this uh, core versus the um, growing beyond the core. So one of the framework I use is called the um, um, uh, Anox uh, framework that I'm not sure you've heard this term, but basically it's, it's a two by two um, matrix. And I'm just briefly talk about that. So that you have your current suite of services and product, and you have a car market. Then you have your current services to new market, new service to car market, new service to new market, right? So you look at how you extend your service line, how you extend your market, how you extend your brand, eventually you create a new brand, right? So we went through that exercise ourselves that I have different analogy from different industry to talk about perfect um, uh, illustration. So uh, I would encourage, we think about today, there's a core, whatever we do, there's a current market, right? Sometimes you do want to do um, market segmentation to deliver different value to a sub sub, sub market to your current market. Um, segmentation but then sometimes you go to um, different market segment international domestic or post-acute you know home care versus the um, long-term care sometimes you look at a car market and bring a new innovation that to my car market to to expand my current portfolio so there's a two by two matrix that that actually you can google that uh anox framework that's one framework we can look at how do we grow beyond our current core very good, very good. Thank you for that. Um, another question that has emerged has to do with maybe the uniqueness of healthcare. When you are building a culture of innovation in the healthcare industry, um, are 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 these principles universal, or that would apply? You would use these principles in any industry, or there are maybe one or two principles that are very unique and very important for the healthcare industry itself when it comes to building a culture of innovation. Yeah, this is a great question. I, I, you know, I spent all my life in, in, in healthcare, and uh, I, I definitely know a little bit outside healthcare in terms of um, financial industry and consumer industry. And also, we are the consumers of a lot of innovation, like Ubers and, and uh, online payment, every other things, right? So the key here is I realized that it's been difficult. It's been challenging to bring innovation to healthcare. It really had to do with our um, the physician uh, clinician workflow. So I started my, myself in the past 15 years working with physicians, right? All my career bring values, whether it is EMR or electronic prescription or um, patient engagement or, or patient referral or whatever the things that we do. I, I always find that it's not easy to uh, deliver that value to clinicians so that they can appreciate 
the value we add to the workflow. So one thing I always do is to make sure that that it's not just always about innovation. It's, it's not always about technology. As you mentioned earlier, it's about how do I bring that value creation that fit into the clinical workflow of my customers. So that's that is something that is hard to do, and uh, and also engaging clinician in 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 making the the process change, in making the the, uh, the technology change. I would pay a lot of attention in making sure we can engage our our clinicians. That's always been difficult in healthcare. Well, well said, well said. Uh, with um, with implementing innovation um, and, and trying to start the journey of uh, building a culture of innovation in a healthcare organization, um, do you, um, I mean, you mentioned examples where, you know, we have the board of directors involved, you have senior leadership teams involved, and there is no doubt that if you have that top-down support, everything that you try to do in an organization flows more easily. Um, curious as to... Uh, if my leadership team is not really open for that discussion right now, um, do, do bottom-up approaches to innovation work uh, at any level or they are just a complete waste of time? I think the bottom-up approach works to a certain degree. For example, you can bring process improvement, right? Innovation happens at all levels. So I, I'm trying to make the point is that anybody, any team, any staff has a role to play in innovation, right? You serve your customer in this way, but you can save that customer wait time by half. Well, by applying a new technology, new tool, new process change, I think that to me, that's innovation too, because you save your customer's time by half. So I, I think that I, I encourage all my staff to, uh, to think about different way of serving our customers. So I do feel there's tremendous value from the bottom to top approach, because at the end of the day is our staff who are actually taking care of our customers, right? Not 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 the C-suite, but to make transformation happen, a different market, a different business model, right? That requires strong vision from your board, from your investors, from your C-suite. So that's something that is that is crit critical to have. So I would say that that um, yes, the bottom to top approach works to a certain extent, but transformation changes need to be driven by both top to bottom and bottom up. And last comment I have is that if you leadership team are not sometimes not willing to listen to that ideas, one thing you can work around, which I did myself in the past is to engage your customers. When the customers speak up, right? When they have urgency to change, then that brings the um, credibility, bring the weight. Um, sometimes I see leaders open their eyes because a key client is saying, hey, you, you gotta move this direction, right? So I would engage our customers. That's excellent, David. Thank you for that. And the last question we have time for here is uh, one related to building skills and capabilities. Uh, if you look at individual and professional skills and organizational capabilities, what are the type of skills and capabilities that people and organizations should be looking to build to become more innovative, to become to do innovation for value creation, as you said. Is there some skill building that needs to take place there with the workforce and uh, with the leadership, of course, and or kind of organization, foundational organizational capabilities that need to be built? That's a fantastic question. So I'm looking at ourselves, the past six, seven years journey at the Joint Commission, we have done a lot of changes. Again, you know, year over year, bit by bit, to brought in different skill set. And sometimes it's through internal acquisition, uh, training, development, sometimes it's through new hires. So a couple areas that I felt myself, I see a drastic change. I see the impact and I learned myself on my peers, my colleagues as well. One has to do with um, the product management skill set. So think about how do you run strategy, product management and, and bring the value creation to your, to your um, customers and also knowing the competitive uh, landscape. I really felt that each different product line we brought in some strong leaders to to steer around that portal lines. I think that's that's a skill set that's really critical. The portal marketing, the digital marketing. When I joined the uh, the Joint Commission resources, we're doing catalog, we're doing paper based marketing. In, in over the past seven years, things have changed so much in terms of content based digital marketing to do, to see the um, social media, to have marketo mark, marketing automation, to get a sentiment right, understand the customer sentiment and what customers are telling us. And, uh, and also use the uh, nine promoter score, NPS, to gauge the customer loyalty to our brand and really understand our brand value. So 
I, I one of my my co coworkers and, and he he brought in tremendous innovation in the digital marketing. I felt that's just a uh, just it's kind of a in, imperative to uh, to executing our, our innovation. So last but not least is also the um, our, uh, our customer engagement um, team in terms of driving change. Because a lot of time we we create a service, we create a new technology, create a new product, right? It, it, it needs the process um, change to to be adopted, right? There's now anything one fits one size fits all. So we have a great change management team that engage culture changes, leadership changes within our customer organization. I saw that. That's, that skill set is so critical as well. So those are three examples, product marketing, product management, and also change management. David Ku, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. On behalf of our global excellence and innovation uh, leadership team, you know, that's participating in this in these sessions, we have learned so much from you and your experiences and your insights, and we very much appreciate that. Thank you so much. My pleasure as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was David Ku. He is the Global Vice President for the Joint Commission Center for Transforming Healthcare. Uh, great insight, great experience, great leadership of uh, on building a culture of innovation in healthcare. So fantastic. We, we, we finished today's session on a high note. I encourage you to engage with our speakers on the links that we have provided to you throughout the sessions via the chat. Uh, you can look up my name, Jose Pires, on LinkedIn, and you'll see the links and the communications happening there uh, uh, related to the conference. I'll also post a short summary of uh, the presenters today and the way that you can connect with them uh, directly um, by looking at checking out that post. Uh, tomorrow, let's take a quick look at what's coming on day two. We're going to kick off tomorrow morning. Well, whatever you are in the world, different time zones. We're going to kick off with a session on the Mayo Clinic and specifically with a research manager and system architect for the programs and the Mayo Clinic. And he's gonna talk about healthcare information and creating patient controlled, standardized, secure and open data structures. Bit more of a technical procession on uh, what the Mayo Clinic is doing, um, uh, of course, related to its technologies, to technology and strategy. Uh, we are gonna follow that up with empowering excellence in R&D. And uh, that's gonna come from the operational excellence leader and R&D leader in North America from Sanofi. So Vatsala Sadazivan is going to be with us and she's gonna guide us through the, um, the empowerment of excellence in research and development. Uh, and uh, follow that up with stop the innovation killing, how to become the innovation champion your organization needs. Fantastic session with the Tilstra duo and the Tilstra and uh, Dr. Karen Tilstra are going to discuss about how healthcare is accelerating innovation through through this approaches, integrated approaches and creating environments where great people and great ideas can connect. Uh, so uh, always a great session uh, with Dr. Karen Tilstra and, and the Tilstra. And tomorrow we wrap up with uh, Donald Cook. Donald Cook is the president and CEO of his own company, and he is a world-class uh, speaker in healthcare, in technology, in improvement and innovation. And he's going to wrap up tomorrow talking about a focus on transformation in healthcare through intelligent automation. And uh, you, Donald just has too much in his resume for me to cover here. Uh, you do not want to miss the session. On, with someone who has more than three, four decades on uh, on uh, transforming healthcare organizations uh, and uh, and and cross industry organizations outside of healthcare as well. So thank you again for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And again, connect on LinkedIn and uh, follow the journey over there. Whatever you are in the world, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you back tomorrow. <music>